Praise the Lord, church. I'd like to welcome everyone back to another online service. As the pastor says, hope that everyone's staying saved and safe. I'd just like to go over a few quick announcements for everyone. Remember, if you have any prayer requests, names added to the prayer list, or any praise reports, please send those to cljcrequests at gmail.com. Uh, since we're unable to pass around the, the fasting calendar, please continue up to do your, your normal dates. Uh, if you're feeling extra generous, you know, throw a few extra meals on there. Well, we need fasting 24 seven during this time. Uh, remember when all of our videos drop, uh, it's 8 a.m. on YouTube for Sundays, 10 a.m. on Facebook for Sunday service. Uh, Brother Thomas's lessons on Wednesdays are available on Wednesday at 5 p.m. on both platforms, as well as our Sunday school lessons that drop on Friday night are available on YouTube and Facebook at 5 p.m. Uh, just want to continue to let everyone know that while we're down here, we're continuing to pray over the names of the box, the soldiers, everything that the elders prayed for when we had service, we're continuing to pray for those things. And also the pastor is continuing to read out the names on the prayer list and he's continuing to pray for them daily. Lastly, we just want to continue to thank everyone that makes this possible. Uh, thank the choir for the songs. Thank Brandon Need for opening their house up to me. I uh, thank for, for everyone that gets the messages ready. Those are down here recording, everyone that edits, uploads, and any part that you played in this. We just want to thank everyone. We thank the pastor for trusting us to do this. And most of all, we want to thank God for making this possible. So if you guys need anything, need help with anything, need someone to talk to, just if you need anything at all, just reach out to us, call, text, email, stop by, whatever it is. We love you guys, we want to help you, and we hope to see you soon. Thank you. I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. And then a little light from heaven filled my soul. It bathed my heart in love. And broke my name above And just a little talk with Jesus makes me whole Oh, let us have a little talk with Jesus Let us tell him all about our troubles He will hear our faintest cry And he will answer by and by When you feel a little prayer will turn in You will know that a fire is burning You will find a little talk with Jesus makes you cry But Jesus is a friend who watches day and night. I go to him in prayer. He knows my every hair. And just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Oh, let us have a little talk with Jesus. Let us tell him all about our trouble. He will hear our famous cry and he will answer by and by. When you feel a little prayer will turn in. Good afternoon, church. Hope everybody's doing well and staying saved and safe. Hope you've had a good week this week. Uh, ask you uh, to continue to remember all of our prayer requests and continue to remember send any praise reports that you have. Um, Remember Miss Peggy Suffin, remember Thomas, remember uh, Rusty, uh, continue to remember Brother Jay, uh, all these people, and just thank the Lord for all the things that he has done for us while we've been out. Uh, thank the Lord for Dale having a good, safe surgery and all the good uh, praise reports that we have. Uh, this uh, evening we are continuing on with our lessons on the great mercy. Um, this evening's lesson is on March the 14th, the 2021, lesson two, and it's our your first love. The focus thought is... We must stay focused on our first love, Jesus Christ. Focus verse is Revelation 2, 4 through 5. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works. Or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of its place, except thou repent. 
And then the lesson text is Revelations 2, 1 through 7. And to the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are, are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars. And hast borne, and hast patience, and for the, my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, um, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And let's pray. Lord, we thank you, Lord, so much for your mercies and grace and all the things you've done for us. We're always watching and keeping in God and blessing us, protection. Lord, your provision. Lord, your healing. God, your safety. God, just thank you so much for all the things you've done. Most of all, God, thank you for salvation. Thank you for Calvary. God, for the blood that you shed on Calvary for our sins. God, we appreciate you, God. We thank you, Lord. Lord, God, I glorify you, Lord, for salvation, for repentance, baptism in your name, then filling that the Holy Ghost, Lord. And I thank you, Lord, that you chose us, God. You chose me, God. You looked at me one day, <clears throat> God, and give me a chance, God. I just appreciate you, Lord. Thank you, God. Bless this service. God bless this word. God bless my voice. God, let the word be from you. God, let the, my thoughts, let the thoughts be from your mind and not my mind and from your heart and not my mind, God. Lord, we just ask you, Lord, just to remember our hearts, God. Bless the pastor. Bless all the church. Watch over and keep us and guide us and bless us, Lord Jesus, God. And let this service, let this word, God, touch somebody's heart. We ask you to do it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Name God, give you praise. Jesus, God, thank you, Jesus, thank you so much. And God, we praise you, Lord Jesus, thank you. And you may be seated. <clears throat> Irreconcilable differences. I think we probably all heard of this before, but you may not know exactly what it is. You may even be asking, where in the world have I heard this from? And it's a common term used in divorces, and it's a reason for asking for a, a divorce from your husband or from your wife. I um, did some looking up on it. I found a, a website that's dealing with men's rights that said that divorce on the grounds of irre irreconcilable differences is a popular option in recent years among troubled marriages, but many people don't even technically know what it means. It just means they, they, they use that as a reason, but they really don't know what it is. And this website said that their team of lawyers have assisted in countless divorce settlements that have been filed under these grounds, and they are there to help you understand what it means. They go on to say that irreconcilable differences technically means that an in individual or their spouse cannot get along with one another uh, to keep the marriage alive and that this lack of getting along can cause a whole array of other issues in the marriage. Uh, it doesn't matter what caused the rift between uh, the, the two for the marriage, but it just means that it's it's not fixable. It's not repairable. And people feel as if they can't sustain the marriage, so they can't come up with a reason for why they can't sustain the marriage, so they just say uh, it's irreconcilable differences. And it's called a no-fault divorce. No one is really at fault here. No one committed adultery. No one. There was no abuse. There's no nothing else like that. It was just they don't love each other anymore. People don't need to come to a mutual agreement as to why they are divorcing, so they just file under the reason of irreconcilable differences. In other words, we don't know why we want a divorce, we just want one. <laughs> That's it. I just don't love them, I don't want to live with them, I don't want to be around these people anymore. <clears throat> Another legal site actually gave some possible examples of irreconcilable differences just in case you couldn't put your finger on it. And so uh, we'll name me a couple of those. It's disagreement on finances, loss of trust, Work that causes long-distance separation, lack of intimacy, 
personality conflicts. And I, when I read that one, I said, well, aren't men from Mars and women from Venus or something like that? Anyway, communication difficulties, failure to help in the household, potential political, opi- different po- political uh, uh, opinions, uh, in-law environment, growing apart due to different life goals or interests. But they, they gave these examples and I'm looking at it and they give the examples and I'm like, well, if they give examples, then how can it not be somebody be at fault? If there is a reason, actual reason for, for to, to say it's irreconcilable differences, there has to be a fault. It's got to be someone's fault. Someone chose not to work through these issues. Someone chose not to work through an issue with finances. Someone Cause something to happen to be a loss, a, a lack of trust. Someone calls, uh, you know, someone's off working. You know, they chose as a family for him or her to walk, work long distances away from home and be separated for long points, uh, periods of time. So th- they they had to come to this conclusion. They had to see what this was, but nobody bothered to work through it. And maybe it was both of them. Maybe it was both of them came, you know, the, 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 the man and the woman come up with this. And so then both of them are at fault. It, it is an at fault. It, it has to be someone's fault. So, But someone has to be at fault. The love that they started out having for one another is just no longer there, just plain and simple. But one or both of them has lost that first love. And if you can pinpoint the reason for the the love loss and you can give an example of the reason for the love loss, like the website gave, then it can't be irreconcilable. It has to be able to be fixable. Just someone, one part of of the equation doesn't want to do it. Either the male or the female, they don't want to have a part in fixing it. They want to go there. Rather than take the time and the energy to, that it takes to, 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 for the investment to fix the marriage, they would prefer to go their separate ways. But thank God, God doesn't feel that way about us. Thank God he, doesn't always, he wants to fix the problem. And that's what Jesus talked about to the, the, the church at Ephesus in the second chapter of Revelations. He saw the reason, he saw that there was a love loss, and he saw that there was a reason for the love loss, and then he told them how they could go about fixing, fixing it. Last week we'd said that John had turned around uh, upon hearing the voice, and he saw someone in the midst of the candlesticks, and that was Jesus, the Son of Man. And he was standing in the midst of those seven candlesticks, and those seven candlesticks represented the seven churches of Asia. But we also said that it could represent churches down through the ages, and it could so these churches uh, could represent churches of today. Uh, it could represent specific individual churches. It could represent specific people in specific churches. So to me, that when you read these lessons and you read about these seven churches in Revelation chapter two, three, and make going into four, it can mean anybody. It can mean a church. It can mean a whole group of people. It can mean an organization. It can mean the church as a whole, but it could also mean us as individuals. So these scriptures, these these churches apply to me. It applies to you. It applies to these guys that are here. It, reply, it applies to everybody. So this message is a message to all of us. It, it's, a, it's a warning, a heeding to all of us. And what happened to Ephesus is something that's very dangerous because they were doing a work for the Lord. They were doing the work of God. They were doing something for Him. And then something happened. Somewhere along the way, something changed. uh, And it wasn't doing the work, but it was the reason why they were doing the work. It was the heart and the mind in behind doing the work of God. They They got so tied up. They got so wrapped up. They got so tangled up that they lost something and they didn't even realize that they had lost it. Jesus told John, he said, write this down. I want you to write it. I want you to let them know where they are at in this relationship. Let them know that I'm getting ready to divorce them. I'm sending them the paperwork and this is not going to be a no-fault divorce. There is an issue here. There is a problem in the relationship and it is with them and they are the reason. They are the fault. But it's also not irreconcilable differences. There, it, it can be fixed if they can just remember. Revelation chapter 2, 1 through 3. Uh, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven candle, golden candlesticks. I know thy works, I know thy labor, thy, and thy patience, and how thou canst bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say, which say they are apostles and are not, and has found them liars, 
and hast borne and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored and hast not fainted. To the church of Ephesus, I want you to write these things down. This is going to be specifically directed to the church. It was a, a message to them. And when you hear messages preached and we hear lessons that are taught, they are taught to an entire church. They're ta taught to the entire body of believers. But going back to the part where we said that these churches could actually mean uh, individuals, uh, each of us individually, occasionally God can single out individuals out that he is dealing with when he gives a message to, to a church. It's applied to everybody. It can be applied to everyone, but it's actually meant for one specific purpose. The reason that God brought the message forth that Thomas, you know, he was, he was wearing the wrong color shoes. And so God preaches about, Thomas, you're wearing black shoes and you're supposed to be wearing brown shoes. God brings out the message uh, about about that and so it's geared but Tom's but we're all supposed to be wearing the right color shoes now of course you know it's not really about shoes so just use that as an example and that but that's the cool thing about about God as much as he loves all of us as a group he lo loves each and every one of us as individually he came in the form of Jesus and he died for all but he died for me you know, as much as he died for all these people and all you people that are out there that's listening to this, it's very personal to me because he died for me. God died for me, and I thank him so much that he saw me. The fact that he died for you should make you feel very special today. And the fact that he was writing this letter to the church of Ephesus should make them very special, feel special because God was saying, I love you enough to have John to show him a revelation that he can write down to you. And I thank God. I thank him so much that he loved loves us individually. He loves each and every one of us. Each stripe, each thorn that pierced his head, every drop of spit that was on him, that was spit upon him was for you, it was for me, and it's for all of us as individuals. Ephesus should have felt very, very special when they heard this, when, when, Jesus, when they read this letter and said, said that Jesus said, write this down. This is for you guys. I want you to write it down. God thought enough of them to move on John to have him write a note to them, a letter to them. And it was for he that had the seven stars in his hand, the one, the one that gave the direction to the seven, the seven stars represented the seven spirits of the seven churches. And if you, if you remember what we talked about that last Friday, you, if you missed it, you missed the significance of it. That means that Christ was the one that was standing in the midst of the seven, of the seven candlesticks and he held the seven stars, which represented the seven spirits of the seven churches. And so Christ is the one that gave power to the church. He is the one that gave the direction to the church. He is the one, the source of oil. Everything, you know, all, it's all in him. Everything, everything from salvation, uh, the Godhead, everything revolves around Christ and he is the he is the source of our direction and he's still the source of uh, of the direction today. If you as an individual or even as a, us as a church, if we don't have Christ walking in our midst, if we don't have him walking in our hearts, we don't have him actively involved in what's going on in the church and in our lives, we are powerless. We don't have that oil, we don't have that direction, we don't have that power behind us that, that, that directs our steps and where we need to go. We don't have the power to over overcome the enemy uh, and overcome the things that the enemy is throwing at us and will not have the power to leave this earth when the trumpet's blown, as Brother Thomas was talking about on Wednesday. He told them, he said, I know your works. I know your labor. I see the works that you are do doing. He knows the number. Of God... <laughs> God knows. He, he is omniscient. He, he knows everything. He knows everything that goes on in our lives from the moment that we go to bed at night to, to the moment that we wake up to the next morning and everything in between, everything that goes on every hour, every moment of the day, He knows. He sees our works. He sees the labor of our hands. He sees the lack of work. He sees the lack of labor. He knows all things. He knows the number of the hairs on our head. I've joked so much you don't have to remember as much with me anymore, but He sees the spirit. Sparrow. He, he feeds the ravens. He clothes the lily. God knows all these things. He sees these things. In Luke chapter 12, verse 4 through 7, he said, And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you whom I will forewarn you whom you shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed, killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. 
are not five sparrows sold for two farthings and not one of them is forgotten before God? And even, and, but even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, ye are more value than many sparrows. Jesus told his disciples, he, he told this to his disciples, and as he was telling them, he said that there was a great multitude that had surrounded them, even so much that they began to trample on one, of, uh, one another. And in verse 1 of that chapter, he said, it said that he began to say unto his disciples, first of all, he told them before he told anybody else, here's all this big crowd that surrounded them and people were running on top of each other. But it said that he told his disciples, first of all, he gave them assurance. He said before, before he gave it to anybody else, he said, don't fear what's going on around you. Don't fear the chaos. Don't fear everything that's, that's happening. One, I want to warn you about what to fear. Fear God more than anything else. Fear him. And he told his disciples that while this chaos is going on, on around him, don't fear the chaos what's going on fear God be respectful of God be honorable of God don't fear what's going on and and we look at the worlds today there's so much that's going on around us uh, here now we we don't know what to fear we don't know uh, why to fear we don't know what to fear we don't know what what not to fear we don't know what to worry about what not to worry about do we fear the government do we fear the police do we fear the Democrats do we fear the Republicans do we fear what we can say about who what we in, in public you know we have to keep our Mouths quiet. Uh, some have fear about the virus, but they don't have fear about the vaccine. Some have fear about the vaccines, and they don't have fear about the virus. Some fear both. Some don't fear any of them. But God said, don't fear any of that stuff. Don't worry about any of that stuff. He said, fear and honor and respect me. He said, your tomorrow. He said, all your tomorrows, it's got to come by me. That's what the song says. All my tomorrows have to come by him. So he's going to see either one of them. He didn't, say, he didn't give us the spirit of fear, but he gave us a power and he gave us love and he gives us a sound mind he remembers every bird he remembers every sparrow he remembers to feed the rain every morning you know we well I, you know you get up and you have to remember i got to fix the bowl of cereal for the kids god never forgets to feed the ravens he never forget he's not going to forget us church he's never going to forget us no matter what's going on we do not have to fear we do not have to worry about anything we just need to trust god we are worth way more than any of those birds. So he said he knew, that he knew their work. He knew their work. He knew their patience. He knew all the things that they did. He, he saw it. He saw the work they did. did. They, he saw the works of their hands. And he, he, he knew the things that was going on. And said that he knew their patience as well. It's not enough for us just to work and to be busy for the Lord. we got to have patience about the business. We have to learn how to wait. G wait. Jesus said that he, he would be hated for all men's, for, for, for uh, he would be hated, or we would be hated of all men for his namesake. But then he said, told them not to worry about it. And then he told them what not worrying would do for them. Luke chapter 21, 17 through 19 says, and you shall be hated of all men for my namesake. He's talking to the disciples, but that rolls down to the church. That's to us. He said, but there shall not one hair of your head perish. So don't worry about it. He said, you're going to be hated of all men, but don't worry about it. You're not going to lose one hair of your head. But then he said, in your patience, in your patience, possess you your soul in your ability to stay on the path and not veer off because something you see something up ahead of you in your ability to endure even the hatred of men that's where you come into possession of your soul that's where you keep possession of your soul that's where you control what's going on because we have a, you know salvation comes from the lord but it's us up to us to do the things that we get saved we have to we have to repent we have to be baptized we in jesus name we have to be filled with the holy ghost we have to do our part. We, we have a little bit of control in this thing. And so we have to learn to wait. We can be diligent. We can have an uh, energetic effort. We can, we can be diligent of, about doing work and, and, and some things. But if we don't have patience to wait on the Lord, we're going to miss out on whatever it is that God has for us. If we don't have the patience to wait on him, uh, the, the old saying says that patience is a virtue. It's a beneficial quality that we should all have. And, and the ability, the, having the ability to wait 
on God, to wait on Him to move in our lives, to wait on Him to work in our situations, to wait on Him to come back one day, to wait on Him to the end of all this stuff, whatever's going on, we get back to church. we got to learn to wait. Whatever it is that God's got going on, we just going to have to look. Right. We can't look in, in our waiting, in our being patient, in, in our waiting on God to move. That's where we possess our soul. And when we decide to make, don't, but when we go off and we do foolish things and we go off and uh, half-cocked and go and do things our way, that's when we're going to lose possession of our soul. When we begin to do our, our thing. That's why he said, wait, 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 I say, wait on the Lord. Wait on God to tell us exactly what to do in everything in your life. And God says, Ephesus, you've got that. You've got patience. You had works. You had labor. You, you had patience. Jesus told Ephesus, I've seen these things. He went on and said, you can't bear those that are evil. You've tried those that say that they're apostles and they're not. And you have found them to be liars. And here's, a, here's another good quality that we should have, uh, that we shouldn't be putting up with people that are evil. And I'm not talking about sinners. You know, that we got sinners that we have to be around, that we have to be lights and witnesses to. But there are people that are just evil out there. There are things out in the world that are just evil. There are TV shows. There are movies. There are some things out there that are just evil. And he said, yeah, you, you just don't bear with that stuff. You don't, you don't put up with it. You don't watch it. You don't participate in it. Be careful. Thomas said it on Wednesday night. He was talking about be careful about who you're around. Be careful for who you hang out with. Be careful because you don't ever know what spirit you're going to pick up. Off, off of these things. You hang around evil people, you get around things, you might pick up some of that stuff that they, they got on. Even if you think you're trying to witness to them, be careful about being around some of this stuff. Don't, don't bear with that stuff. Don't hang out with it. You don't want the spirit that's in behind that. You don't want that on you. There are people out there that are just injurious. There are evil people that are just injurious. They want to cause injury. They may be looking to injure you rather than waiting to see what kind of effect that you have on their life. And it's hard for us to be guarded against people like that because we don't think that way. I always said, I think one of the first messages that I ever preached here at the church was, to, was talking about how, um, how it's tough to fight terrorists because we don't think like terrorists. A terrorist will take somebody and he'll, he'll, he'll strap explosives on, his stu- on himself and he'll go step into a middle of a crowd that he has no idea who they are and blow them up for just in the name of religion or political, whatever it is. And, and it's hard to think like that. It's hard to, to it, you know, you, it says you, you need to know your enemy. Well, it's hard to know that stuff. And it's hard for us to know evil when you don't, you know, in, in, in my mind, the last thing I want to do is hurt somebody. I don't I have no desire to hurt anybody. So it's hard for me to be guarded to think about people that are out there actively that just want to hurt people, that just want to be evil. So I don't I don't want that stuff. I don't want I don't want to be around that stuff. And Thomas talked about it a couple again, a couple Wednesdays ago. He's talking about those the the spirit a spiritual gift of discernment, the ability to sense something, that someone, something, or an event through the Spirit to have an understanding of it. That's, that's a good quality we need as a church. We need to be, we need to hear, we need to ask God, well, I need that spirit of discernment. I, I want to know w- what somebody's up to. I want you to put that spider sense in me that says, oh, oh you need to back away from this thing, the little tingly or uh, goosebumps, whatever it is that, that tells us, get away from this. And if you've got the spirit of discernment, that's a value value to the church. You're a value to the church. You're a value to your family. You're a value to the, the, to the pastor because you can sense those people that are evil. Someone that's out to do, not somebody that's not a sinner. I'm not talking about sinners. I'm talking about those evil people. He said, you won't bear with them. Ephesus, you won't bear with them. And he said that then you see those people that, that are apostles, those people that say that they're, they're men of God and they're not. And men say, you know, these men that think they say they know the doctrine and they know who the God they are, or God, they know who God is, and they say, say they preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. You got to be careful about that stuff. You got to be watch who you're listening to. You have to be careful about where you're going and what you're hearing. Hearing. Be careful of who you're setting under. Be careful who you're listening to. Make sure they're preaching the real gospel of Jesus Christ. Make sure they're repenting. They're preaching repentance. Make sure they're preaching baptism in Jesus' name. Make sure they're re- uh, preaching the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Because if they don't have that revelation. How are you going to trust them with anything else? I always said about these pro- these people that was prophesying back at the uh, about Trump and all this stuff, and that some of them people were listening to them, and these were people that didn't even baptize in Jesus' name. I was like, if they can't get the, if they can't read the Bible and they can't 
see baptism in Jesus' name, I'm not going to trust them with anything else. I'm not going to sit there and listen to them. And, and I'm not going to sit under, I'm not going to sit there and listen to somebody that, that's not preaching the truth. I'm not going to listen to them. They may have some good ideas, but I, I don't want what they got dishing out because I don't want the spirit that's in behind that. I don't want this spirit. If they can't figure out what truth is, if they can't figure out the, the, the repentance and baptism in Jesus' name, that Jesus was God in the flesh, that there's only one, if they can't figure out, I don't want anything else false doctrine that they're, pro they're preaching. I don't, want to, I don't want it around me. And so uh, he said that Ephesus, you, you tried these people. You, you checked them out. You, you asked questions. And, and just because somebody seems to be spiritual and just because somebody sounds good doesn't mean you put your, egg, your eggs into their basket. 1 John 4 and 1 says, Beloved, believe not every spirit. Don't believe every spirit. He said, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because there's many false prophets are gone out into the world. And Thomas talked about it Wednesday. He was talking about false prophets in there. He said, beware, you know, you, you have to beware of those people that are telling you, well, well, God told me, God told me to tell you, God told me to s send this to you. God showed me that this was going to happen. Mark it down, right? Just like God, Jesus told uh, uh, John, right? Write it down when they say this is, this, this is going to happen right now. And then when it doesn't happen, <laughs> See you, sayonara. I don't want a whole lot to do with you because I don't know what spirit you are of. I don't know. Jesus told James and John, he said, you guys don't know what spirit you are of when they want to come down and, and, and have fire come down from heaven. He don't know well, because they were speaking something that wasn't of God. Well, when somebody tells you that they're speaking something of God and they said, God told me and it didn't. God told me this was going to happen and God showed me this was going to happen and it doesn't happen. Write it down because... It may not be from God. And you, then you got to start asking, what, what spirits are they actually listening to? So it's one, thing for some, uh, and it's one thing for somebody to say, I feel this. But it's another thing when somebody says, God told me to tell you. When somebody says, God told me to tell you, you better be careful and watch of it. Ephesus had labored in the name of the Lord and they hadn't faded. They had remained faithful to the work of the Lord. Even when times got tough, they didn't faint and they didn't let the pressure get to be too much on them. Galatians 6 and 9 says, Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. And there are times when we walk a walk for the Lord and that walk gets hard. You might be the only one in your house that is living for God. You might be the only one that's trying to live for God. And you may feel like there's, you know, you're not having any kind of effect on those people that are around you. You may feel like that nothing's ever going to happen. Uh, the husband, the wife, the kids, the grandkids, or whatever, they're never going to come into it. But be, don't be weary in well-doing. Don't be weary in walking the walk. Don't be weary in this thing. You're going to reap in due season when the time comes. The seeds are going to, seeds that might be planted are going to be coming up. They don't come up during the wintertime. They begin to come up in late in spring and summer. When the season comes, when it happens, it's going to happen. Don't be weary in this. Don't allow it to wear you out. Jesus said, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Don't let the work of the Lord wear you out. Trust God. Jonathan talked about it, uh, was talking about it on, uh, on, on Sunday. Man, we got to trust, we got to trust God. We got to put our, our, our hands in, in God. And this is the guarantee that God has given to us. If we don't faint, we're going to reap. If we don't faint, when we're, we'll reach the top of the mountain one of these days. We're going to get to wherever it is that we need to be going. And, and God is going to get a response out of people for us. There's going to be changes. Whatever it is, just hang in there. Just trust God. You just keep on doing. You just keep on doing well. You just keep on doing the work of God. God will finish. He is able to finish the work that he started in you. Now, all these good things that he said about Ephesus, that, you know, he knew their works. He knew the labor. He knew that they had faith. He knew that they tried the false doctrines. He knew that they didn't bear those with evil. But then he had a nevertheless, or you could actually say that was a but. Revelations 2 and 4. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Despite all this good stuff, Jesus had said something. He had something against them, something that they had allowed to creep into their lives. They had lost 
their first love. They lost the reason why they were doing all this work. They lost the reason why they were, had all the patience. They lost all the reason why they were, uh, they were verifying these apostles and they couldn't, wasn't putting up with this evil. All the work, all the labor, all the patience, they had lost the reason why they were doing it. And even though they were doing a work in his name, they had lost the reason that had started them out doing this work in the first place. They were so wrapped up and they were so tied up and they were tangled up in doing a work for the Lord that they lost their love for the Lord. And that's hard to believe that you can do that. It's hard to believe that you can be, you know, I'm doing a work for God. I'm, I'm, I'm playing and I'm preaching and I'm teaching and I'm cleaning and I'm doing all this stuff for God. And you say, how in the world can you do that? But people that are really busy for God have to really guard against being busy for God. There's a lot of times in, in, in church that, you know, when I've came into the church and I've had the Sunday school lesson on my mind, but then I'm coming in and I'm worrying about tuning guitars and checking temperatures and, and not temperatures of people, but temperatures on the thermostat, checking temperatures and, and starting the sound up and starting computers up. And I run around and I've got all these, I've got to get this done. I've got to get that done and write this check and write this and do this and that. And, but my head is not always exactly where it needs to be. All of that stuff is important. The, the instruments tuning it and getting the, the temperature just right for everybody. And of course, that's impossible. But you know, just trying to get a good temperature that everybody is, well, we better just leave all that alone. Just setting the temperature. How about that? Trying to get all this stuff done. Try, it's all important. But the most important thing is my relationship with God. First and foremost, more than doing a work for God, more than feeding the poor, more than going out and helping, more than, than teaching and preaching, i got to make sure that I have my relationship with God in, in the right place. What I do for church it will lose its, its power if my relationship with God is not right. That spirit of discernment that I might have, it will wane. That, those anointed messages that I might have, they're going to lose their anointing. The spirit in behind the things that I do for God, that spirit is going to disappear. It's more important that you make sure that your relationship with God is where it That's needs right. to be. Then you, before going off and deciding, I'm going to work for the Lord, I'm going to do this, make sure that the relationship, make sure that love for God is there. We were talking earlier about divorce and we see so many couples that get busy with their lives and they're working and they've got their career and they're living life through their kids, through football and soccer and basketball and dance, music and whatever, you name it, that they forget that they loved their spouse before they loved all this other stuff. They loved their spouse before they loved their kids. They, they loved their spouse before the basketball came along with Johnny and dance came along with Susie. They loved their husband. They loved their wife before any of this. And they have time and they have energy and, and love invested in their spouse. But they've left that investment just sitting there. And they've not gone back and checked on it and been putting effort back into that investment. And they haven't maintained it. And over time, if you let some Something just set without giving it attention, a, a house, a relationship with your spouse, a relationship with God. It'll not be long before there's going to be serious issues that come along with that relationship. If you think about a relationship with a house, the next thing you know, when the kids are gone, if you spend all your time on your kids and your life has been wrapped up and tied up in, in them, and then all of a sudden you, you, the kids grow up and they're gone and you look and you don't even know each other. Or if it's wrapped up in career and work and, and getting somewhere when retirement comes, here you are with the spouse and all of a sudden you don't know who you, you know you don't know who you are uh, you don't have any likes you don't even have you don't have anything in common it's all of a sudden you have irreconcilable differences we don't love each other we don't we're we're different anymore and we don't even know how it happened little things about them get under your skin things that you didn't bother you before because you love them now begins to bother you now all these things become again those irreconcilable differences and it becomes a reason for divorce with God, it's, it's much worse because God is a jealous God. If we give our attention to these things, God is going to let us know it and he's going to make our life hard. If you're giving too much attention to other things and not him, he's going to let you know. Uh, the first commandment shows us, shows us this. Exodus 20, verse 5. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. 
visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and to the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. God will, now God doesn't do that much anymore, but he will visit that upon you. If you don't bow down, if you don't get that relationship right with God, God will let you know. He'll let you know through messages. And then when you don't listen to that, even through things that happen in your life and, and that he's not pleased, he'll show you that he's not pleased with the current state of the relationship. He'll let you know that you've left your first love and he will communicate that to you. Ephesus, they were so busy working for the love working for the Lord that they lost their love for the Lord. Their their love, they grew separated from it. And they're doing this all thinking the whole time, I'm doing something for God. I'm doing something for God, but they grew apart and they focused on doing things rather than loving God. They focused on getting work done. And God says, I'm just not going to allow that to happen. I'm not going to allow you to give your love to work, I'm, whether it's for me or whether it's for somebody else. I'm not going to allow you to do this. I'm, I'm going to show it to you, and then, you're, then you think you're doing something for me, but when you're really doing it for the sake of the work. And God told him, this is not a no-fault divorce. This is, this is someone is at fault, Ephesus. Someone was to blame, and Ephesus, you're the one that's to blame. It's, it's your fault. Jesus had, had given his life. He was totally devoted. He's all committed. He's all in. But they had been the ones that had failed to maintain that relationship with him first and foremost, and they got too busy. Thankfully, though, as I said before, God does not believe in irreconcilable differences. Thank God so much, Lord, that we can't be so different that you don't see that there is a way to get it fixed. God says there are no irreconcilable differences, but we have to be the one that's willing to change. He always says that there's things can be fixed. Revelation chapter 2, verse 5. Remember, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent. And do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of its place. I'm going to give you a divorce, except thou repent. Remember from where you have fallen. Remember where, where you used to be at with the Lord before you fell. Remember you are a servant to sin, and he made you a child of the king. Remember that you were bought with a price. Remember, I, he picked you up out of the miry clay and he set your feet on a rock and that he established your goings. Remember the favor that God had used to given us. Remember the joy of the Lord that was your strength and now you're weary in well-doing. Remember the grace and the peace of God that you had that passed all understanding and now you begin to worry about the least smallest little thing you fear and you worry about things. Remember the feeling of his presence in the middle of the storm and now when the storm comes, you feel every little wave, every little ripple in the water. Remember what it was like when you first loved me. As young adults, when you were young and you were dated, we actually talked about this just a little bit. Excuse me. Before starting here, and I said, I said this, and, and I said, I'm going to talk about that here just in a second. As young adults, when we were young and, and we dated, and you talked about parent, uh, marriage, your parents would look at you, well, well, you can't live on love, you know. But, but back then, when you first were married, you almost could live on love. Brother JB was talking about where he first loved, and his daddy in law, or his dad said, I don't see how in the world you lived in that. And it was like, uh, we just, I said, you were living on love. And then back then, that's all you really needed. You just needed each other that, because you were so in love and it didn't matter where you were at and what you had. None of this, all this other thing, you know, a big house and a nice car and the best brand name things, none of that stuff mattered. I had her, I had him, whatever it is, I had my first love. And as long as I had them, I didn't care about, I, that's all I needed. I didn't need anything else. And it's really like that with God. God, the only thing I really need when it comes down to it, I just need God. I don't need anything else. I need, the, when it comes down to the basic levels, I just need a relationship with God. I need a close love with God. I need to give Him my all because He gives me His all. And that's all I need. That's the most important thing. I don't need anything else except Him. As in my, at the beginning of my relationship with Him, all the way to the end when I'm getting ready to leave this earth, when it comes down to it, all I need is Him. I don't need anything else. I, I, I don't need anything. I need his love. I need his salvation. I need his blood on my life. I need repentance. I need his spirit inside of me. And if I've got him, I'll, he'll take care of the rest. If I'm loving him, I know he's going to love me. I know it's all the, the I have to reciprocate that love. If I'm loving him, I know that God will take 
care of me, and he'll see us through the end. Remember, all you need is his love. All that we really need is that first love, that love that he redeemed us with. Isaiah 44, 21 through 22 says, Remember these, O Jacob and Israel, for thou art my servant. I have formed thee. Thou art my servant. O Israel, thou shalt not be forgotten of me. He said, I have blotted out as thick cloud thy transgressions, as, as a cloud thy sins. Return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. He said, remember this stuff. Jacob, when, you, when, you've, when you've lost your way and, and you've gone astray, remember what, who you are. You're, you're my servant. You're, remember who you are. Remember, remember the day when you, you feel like you're, you're fading away and you don't feel like you've got that relationship with God. Remember what it was like to first love him. Remember what it was like the first when you first repented. And then when you come to church, you just couldn't wait to get here and you couldn't wait to get on your knees and you couldn't wait to hear the first song and you couldn't wait to feel the presence of God. Remember what that was like. Remember what it was like to have that relationship with the first with God. You were that willing servant. You willingly gave your life. And remember that God will never forget you, and you shouldn't ever forget. You shouldn't forget Him. From remember where you are at and strive back to that. God does not believe in the irreconcilable differences, and I thank God so much for that. God don't believe in divorces, and He don't believe in the irreconcilable differences. He does not believe in divorcing His children, but sometimes He will. Sometimes God will. He, he threatened them. He said, repent or I'm going to take your candlestick and I'm going to pull it out. God will take our candlestick out. He will issue the, 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 the papers for a divorce if we don't repent. But thank God we can repent. Thank God we, there is no irreconcilable differences that we can fix the problem. But the problem is with us. Ephesus the problem, you, you're the one that's lost your first love. My love is still there, God said. Your love is not there. You need to turn around. You need to remember. Don't wait for a message that comes from God that says, I'm getting ready to serve the papers. Don't wait for God to send the message from the pastor that says, it's almost over. It's almost over. You guys better hurry up. Don't wait for the papers that, that's getting ready to be delivered that God says, I'm pulling your candlestick. Remember, remember, Put up a reminder. Remember to stay focused on that first love. It's not with the buildings. It's not with music. It's not with running and going and doing and doing work. It's with God. It wasn't, I just wanted to be wherever God was. That's whatever it was. Remember that. Remember to do that. Remember your first love. Remember to keep your relationship with God. Remember to do a, a tune-up with God, a, a relationship. If you have to do a, a week full of fasting television and media and all this other stuff, whatever it is you got to do to spend some time to do a, a, a relationship tune-up with God, do whatever it is because you don't want to hear that message. Nope. I'm getting ready to pull your candlestick. Nope. Remember your first love. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for all your mercies and grace. Lord, help us to remember where our first love was. God, help us to remember. Go back and think about that day God, when we first loved you, God, that when we first felt your presence, God, when we could first feel the Spirit, God, and we had that love for you and we wanted to do whatever it is that we could do for you, God. Don't let us get so caught up in the work and get caught up in things and get caught up in the world, Lord, that we forget where that first love is, God. Help us to go back, God. Help us to do a relationship tune-up, God, that we go back and we look for that first love, God. We diligently search for it, God, and we grab a hold of that first love and we get it in our in our hands and in our hearts and in our minds, God. Go with the church, Lord. Strengthen us, God. Encourage us, Lord. God, help us to get our hearts and minds right with you in these last days, God, whatever might be going on, Lord. God, we ask you, Lord Jesus, God, to, God, whatever you got to do move to get us back in the church, Lord, do it, God, whatever it might be. You do the work. If you got to change the governor, do, it, do that, God. You have the ability to do it. God, get the numbers of these cases down, God. God, bless those people that, that has the virus, touch them and heal them. God, thank you for touching Kevin Lawson. God, just appreciate you for that, God. And God, thank you for touching Brother Gazzara, Lord. Just go with us this week, God. We appreciate you and thank you so much, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. God. Church, remember your first love. We love you. We appreciate you. I hope to see you soon. And I think uh, Brother Dwayne Bailey is going to be preaching on Sunday. So remember that.
we can all meet.